So the waiting is almost over now. It's up to the starter. Clean start. I train six days a week. I only have one day off. I train six hours a day. All I do is eat, sleep and train. Smith is not letting them get away from them and you can hear the crowd going wild. I think on some level, I presumed she would fail. I don't think anybody expected that it ended up happening. 100 metres to go for a second gold medal for Michelle Smith. Can anyone catch her at this stage? She's 15 metres to go to the turn. I think I was just shocked. I think I was in shock. For the final 50 in front, bear in mind, Ireland has never won a swimming medal of any colour, and they're looking at gold. Absolutely astonishing, astonishing achievement. And, you know, from the moment that happened then, I mean, the, the country went absolutely crazy absolutely crazy seven short days in atlanta propelled irish sport in general onto an altogether different plane ireland's greatest olympian michelle smith the 25th anniversary of the greatest fairy tale in irish sporting history almost passed by without mention this summer. But wind the clock back to July 1996, and there was only one name on people's lips. Over the course of one week at the Atlanta Olympics, Michelle Smith blew all previous Irish Olympic performances out of the water. There's nobody in sight. Clearwater in front. Clearwater to the left. 15 meters to go. We've got a gold. On the first night of the 1996 Games, the ambitious swimmer from Rathcool, County Dublin, did something no Irish woman had done before. She won gold at the Olympics, and she did so by destroying the field in the 400 meters individual medley. There had only been four Irish Olympic gold medalists before her, and she did not stop there. She finishes an Olympic Games with an incredible array of medals. I started crying and I thought, am I crying because I won a bronze? And then I thought, no, I'm crying because I'm going home with three gold and a bronze. And I'm really happy. Throughout that week, the nation would watch through the night, enthralled by Michelle Smith's four Olympic final appearances. Crowds descended on her hometown of Rathcool and on the Putchin still, as the country was glued to the action from across the Atlantic. It was absolutely like, like sardines in a tin for, for that particular number of weeks. And by the end of that seven-day period, she had an astonishing three golds and one bronze to her name. Ireland was still a country without an Olympic pool, but now had a triple Olympic swimming champion. She would return to a hero's welcome in Dublin, an open-top bus ride, a civic reception, and she was the star of the end-of-year sports awards ceremonies. There is an envelope. There is the identity of a winner inside. Ladies and gentlemen, the 1996 RTE Ballygown Sports Personality of the Year is Michelle Smith. We asked Michelle Smith to contribute to this podcast, but she said she was not available. She has always denied accusations of cheating during her swimming career. And in a recent statement to RTE Radio, she said her Olympic success was a culmination of 17 years of training and dedication to her sport. My name is Kieran Lennon, and you are listening to Tainted Gold, The Michelle Smith Story, Episode 1, a three-part series that traces her rise and fall, as well as the deep scars that remain to this day. Four years earlier, she'd been on the brink of calling it quits after a disappointing Barcelona Olympics. But by Atlanta, at the age of 26, she had climbed to the top of her sport under the guidance of her coach and husband, Eric De Bruyne. She may have arrived in the Georgia heat with an improved pedigree built on two European goals, but few predicted the medal haul that followed. She was different to the previous Irish Olympic champions, small in stature, but smart and brimming with confidence, with long curly blonde hair, broad shoulders and a steely glare. She knew how to communicate and to stand up for herself, Tell me, what keeps you going? I, I love the sport. I'm really at my happiest when I'm, when I'm training. And maybe that might sound like a, a bit of lunacy when you're getting up at five o'clock in the morning and in the pool at half five. But I really enjoy it. And as long as I enjoy it, and as long as I still think that I can improve, which mm -hmm. I do, I'll keep going. 
Smith was front page and back page news. There were photo ops with American presidents Bill Clinton and Jimmy Carter and statements from President Mary Robinson. But below the din of wild celebrations in Atlanta and in Ireland, there were questions, serious questions about Michelle's dramatic improvements and the doping history of her husband, Eric De Bruyne. But we were hearing stories about how she was training smart. That's Paul Howard, former chief sports writer of the Sunday Tribune. And this came back uh, during the Atlanta Olympics that the secret behind it was that she was training a lot smarter than she was, had before. And But when you asked what training smart meant, it was just very unconvincing. While the country embraced her success with another Italian 90 style celebration, for some journalists, her story didn't add up. How had a swimmer who struggled to make her mark at the two previous Olympics achieve such success in Atlanta? We're not in the fairy tale business as journalists. We're in the truth business. That's the voice of Paul Kimmage. The questions were there, the questions were legitimate, and the questions had to be asked. Let us return to Atlanta and the Olympic swimming pool in that unprecedented summer of 1996. Well, I admit when I saw her win her first gold medal, I was still like, well, you know, oh, that's great for Ireland, that's awesome. That's the voice of Olympic silver medalist Marion Limpert. But yeah, then the rumors started swirling and people were saying, look, like at her age and having not really ever even made it to a final at the Olympics. I also knew, obviously, that there was a, a huge narrative about Michelle. That's Vincent Hogan, sports writer for the Irish Independent. I wasn't deaf to that, but I hadn't been part of that narrative because I hadn't been exploring any of that. However, in the days leading up to the 1996 Olympics, the prospect of Michelle striking gold in the pool was starting to occupy the minds of the Irish reporters in Atlanta, and the implications were being openly discussed. Well, I'll tell you what was being said. Uh, what was being said was, I hope the fuck she doesn't win a medal. Because that would mean we don't have to address it. <laughs> that's ex that's exactly what was being said. Very very few people will admit that, uh, but that's that's exactly what we're all thinking. And I would include myself. I would include myself in that. Paul Howard had followed her career for the Sunday Tribune and felt her improvements were suspicious. When she won the the, the first medal, I, I was in shock. But I didn't think that this would would be a story that would sort of just quietly go away. I did. I knew that it would um, that it would blow up, and that that we would have press conferences at, with, at which this would be discussed. I never felt at the outset, anyway, that this was a hard decision to make. I just went. I, I suppose I went with the flow. It was a full week away from his next deadline for the Sunday Independent, but Paul Kimmage knew straight away what Michelle Smith's first gold would mean for him. She won the medal. It was late on Saturday evening. We'd already gone to press at that stage uh, with Sunday Independent. But it meant that a week later, you know, seven days later, I was going to be writing about the first woman in history, Irish history, first Irish sports woman in history to win an Olympic gold medal. So I had seven days now to write the story. And that was the panic because the questions were there, the questions were legitimate the questions would have to be addressed. We followed her and Eric outside and we asked a couple of questions that she was taken away through a TV interview and then we asked Eric then. We started asking Eric a couple of, uh, I suppose, spiky questions, if you want. One about the Chinese and the level of Chinese performances and one about his own testosterone positive and he did not react well to that at all. He kind of lost the head rust a bit. Throughout that week in Atlanta, Michelle Smith would write an exclusive diary for the Irish Independent. July 22nd, 1996. It's such a fantastic feeling to be standing up there as Olympic champion, knowing the eyes of the world are fixed on your every twitch. Eric, my parents, and the other three million people watching at home make this something you never forget. You're so proud of yourself because others are proud of you. Two days after that breakthrough gold medal, Michelle won again, this time in the 400 metres freestyle. And now we want a second gold. Michelle Smith is surely going to give it to us. It's going to be outside the world record time. And the attention Michelle on her incredible story was multiplying, but so was the scrutiny. The questioning of her hadn't really grown that loud after the first, the first gold. I think it was more the second one, which was at, I think the freestyle, was the second gold medal. And 
you know, there was that controversy about her getting in in the first place. Michelle had initially been told she would not be eligible for the 400 metres freestyle because she was a day late submitting her qualifying time. But after a successful appeal, arguing she had been given the wrong information, Smith was given an 11th hour reprieve. And of course, the great Janet Evans, a four-time Olympic gold medalist, the golden girl of American swimming, missed out in the final, more or less by dint of Michelle getting into the, 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 the race. And that was when the questioning became more aggressive. When the great American swimmer Janet Evans finished ninth in the morning heat, leaving her one place outside the final eight, Michelle's inclusion took on greater significance. So Janet Evans then was upset that she was knocked out of, uh, out of the competition for that particular event. That's Rick Marcy of the Chicago Sun-Times. And she was asked point blank if there had been rumors about Michelle Smith and doping. And she said, you know, yes, there had been, you know, I'm not going to lie. There has, there has been rumors uh, among swimmers that this is the talk, you know, back in the locker room, whatever that this is a topic of conversation. Didn't come out and said Michelle Smith was a cheater, but said, uh, you know, said the cousin of that. When Janet Evans uh, articulated what many were openly talking about by the pools, because they knew Michelle Smith, they knew how how good she was and how good she had been, and they knew what it would take to transform herself into, you know, from, from the old kind of swimmer she was into this new swimmer she was. She simply put it on the record that, look, questions are being asked. Questions are being asked. That's Paul Kimmage again. And that, of course, then lit the touch paper for, for everything that followed, really. It gave it a certain legitimacy, if you want. This was a swimmer, a world-class swimmer, raising the issue of uh, Michelle's performances and putting it on the agenda, if you want. It's one thing when, and I've experience of this, it's one thing when a journalist asks a question, it's another thing when it comes from within the sport, you know? Like a journalist asking is, is someone outside the tent pissing in, as, as Mick McCarthy would famously frame it. But, you know, Janet Evans, a swimmer, is someone inside the tent. And that, that's another level. And that gives it an, an added legitimacy, in my view. Janet Evans' comments raised the stakes and increased the division between those who are perceived to be for her or against her. And I know how it's been sort of framed that it was, you know, sort of America against Ireland. How could this be, this dominant world power in, 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 in swimming? How could, you know, how could this happen? And, and it sounded, I'm sure it sounded sound like sour grapes. And I know that's sort of what the Irish camp portrayed it as at, at the time it was happening. I think when there was a public perception that she was getting a hard time, and I think Irish people don't like Irish people don't like to see another Irish person being attacked abroad. We'll attack our own, but you know. So so when it was spun as you know Janet Evans was the ugly sister, you know, who was kind of raining on Michelle's parade. I think a lot of people got behind her then. You could not argue with the gains she had made. Did not seem did not seem doable. However, Michelle took the scrutiny largely in her stride that week. She was as comfortable in the press room as she was in the pool and remained calm in the media storm. July 27th, 1996. After the first medal, the press conference went fine, but I think an awful lot of people were a bit shocked as they didn't know what kind of questions to ask me. After the 400 free, though, I was expecting the kind of questions they asked me because I knew they'd obviously done their research. You know, I look back on it and I'm, I, I find it staggering how composed she was. That's Vincent Hogan again. It's like you'd nearly believe she had trained for this, that she knew this was coming down the tracks because there was something very steely about her. She used to stare into the face of whoever she was addressing and uh, there, was, um, there was an element of you know, you better be very careful what you're alleging here. So at no point did you ever feel that she was frazzled, not remotely. Eric and Michelle seemed to be the only two people in the world who knew going into the Atlanta Olympics that that she was going to win medals. Um, they really were sure of that. No one else thought they, thought she would. So it was it was such a shock. But I think it was. I think they knew the questions about Eric were coming, and and they were ready with. 
they were ready with the answers. No, I'm not letting anything take away from this joy because, you know, I've really worked so hard. I've put my heart and soul and my whole life into the last three and a half years and I haven't let anything come in my way. I've tried to be as professional as I possibly can and, um, you know, this is, this is the result of it and nothing's going to spoil that for me. You'd have to say she was as impressive out of the pool as she was in it. And she needed to be because there was little let up. I mean, obviously, what, whatever happens, nobody can take these medals away from me. And even uh, if I don't win another medal, I'll be going back a double Olympic champion to Ireland. You know, the questions kept coming harder and harder. And I trained six hours a day. How did you go from smaller figure to... All I do is eat, sleep and train. Somebody with these massive shoulders and these, these massive lats. And I have really put my heart and soul and everything into this. And your, your swimming events, you didn't before and you're dominating in them. And this is the culmination of, of all that hard work and nothing else. You know, I think she was she was almost it was beyond defensive. She was defiant, I think. And and uh and she you know, I think she was having none of it. I mean I, I, I do remember, for example, that uh the president Bill Clinton actually requested could he get his picture taken and and he at the time expressed his disgust with the conduct of the American media or whatever. I think Jimmy Carter had a photo up with her as well. So official America didn't like the way she was treated. Um, and certainly as an Irish journalist, I didn't like the way the American journalists behaved. There may have been, in hindsight, there clearly was a legitimacy to what they were arguing, but I suppose their conduct made it easy to take the other side. The head of the Irish Olympic Council, but he was very very defensive of Michelle's accomplishments and uh, w w was defending her all the way through. And so I can remember that, that it got, it got contentious and people saying, how is this possible? And he, he, he was saying, you know, you Americans are jealous of this, you know, we last. How, how, how is this possible that this girl, well, she did it through hard work. That was the defense that the Irish public wanted to hear. It was an accusation that was very easily leveled at, at Janet Evans. And, um, you know, it was one that we seized. And I say we, a number of the Irish press seized upon, and certainly the Irish public, look, this is just an embittered loser here. Look, we didn't want to address this. When you've got Michelle doing what she was doing, and when I got the cuttings here, you, you know, the hysteria, the hysteria that it... Uh, provoked back home you have a public and all they want to hear and read about is what a fantastic achievement this is what an absolute fairy tale this is and look it was but we're not in the fairy tale business as journalists we're in the truth business and the questions were there the questions were legitimate and the questions had to be asked meanwhile back at home the questions about michelle barely made a ripple in the waters around dublin and rathcool as the Putchin Steel Pub turned into the unofficial headquarters of the Olympic bandwagon. Press and the TVs arrived. That's Louis Fitzgerald, who still owns the well-known Rathcool pub today. And we were getting phone calls from all parts of the world here in the morning time, uh, inquiring to know what's this all about and the, the atmosphere and the whole lot. Journalist Eamon Dunphy would write critical pieces about Michelle for the Sunday Independent during the height of the summer celebrations. But he knew too well how many parts of Irish society would be attracted to Michelle's success. I mean, Irish people love sport. There's a deep love of sport here and, and a deep respect for all the practitioners, but particularly for the greats. This is a great sporting nation. We, I, it's just normal national pride at the achievement. Now, this allows official Ireland to trot itself out in the form of Mary Robinson, who was president at the time, um, all the politicians, the newspapers who are, if you like, feeding official Ireland's needs, uh, and indeed RTE, who are official Ireland's broadcaster, preferred broadcaster. So there was something in it for everybody uh, in terms of reflected glory. Uh, when an athlete or a team excelled on the world stage. Paul Kimmich had been here before when he pulled back the curtain on the world of professional cycling. The backlash at the time had been fierce and he knew something similar lay ahead. I could see it. 
Now I could see it. I mean, you know, we were getting the front pages sent out to, out to us while the papers were going crazy, RTA are going crazy. And so you knew, you knew the joy that the medals had brought to the Irish public. <laughs> I personally knew what it was like to puncture that balloon. And so I knew what was coming. I knew what was coming and I knew it wasn't going to be fun. And it wasn't fun. I, I, I've said it many times in my own career. In the 31 years I've been doing this, the Michelle Smith, the Brood story was the most difficult story by some distance I've ever covered. Much more difficult than Lance Armstrong, even though he was, if you, you could argue, a, a world icon. I found the Michelle Smith, the Brood story much more difficult. Uh, I suppose because it was more personal and um, because I'm not a swimmer. I was a cyclist. I'm not a swimmer. And it was, uh, that made it more difficult for me. There were two camps developing in Atlanta among those who were covering the games. The Irish Independent were among those supporting Michelle, who wrote a diary for the paper during the games and beyond. I think, I, I think you know, it, it literally, you, you, were, you had to go one way or the other. And in many ways, the easy option was the one we, we took. I felt sorry for journalists who had to cover those Olympics on a kind of rolling news basis, who had to cover it every single day. That's Paul Howard again. And they tended to be the ones who appeared to be pro Michelle Smith. Whereas the, you know, the, the, the journalists who are writing kind of weekend think pieces actually had time to sit down. They didn't have to report on the races, for instance. Like, so I'm talking about Paul Kimmage and Tom Humphreys and David Walsh, Eamon Dunphy. They didn't have to file copy after a race, 800 words of copy. It's very difficult to frame this. If you're, if you're writing the main piece for the Irish Independent, for instance, about Michelle Smith's race, it's very difficult to frame it as um, an achievement that, that's not to be believed. When you were on the side of the argument that I put myself on, you used all of those little things to say, mm. you know, this is rubbish, you know, that, and, and obviously you always had the default setting of innocent until proved otherwise, which, um, you know, uh, <laughs> it's something I kind of probably tapped into quite a lot at the time. At the end of an astonishing week, Vincent Hogan would write about a witch hunt against Michelle in Atlanta and how she had paid a vulgar price for the suspicious world we live in. The following day in the Sunday Tribune, Paul Howard was shining a light on the dirty past of Eric de Bruyne while Eamon Dunphy in the Sunday Independent focused on the unavoidable questions. He wrote the scale of Smith's improvement was unprecedented outside the communist world. I looked at it very carefully as, it was, as the story was unfolding. Um, I took into account the circumstantial evidence, uh, which was extremely strong. And I wrote two pieces, I think, questioning the legitimacy of the achievement and supporting those who were deeply sceptical. Eamon was asking very, very good questions, the right questions, from home, from Dublin. And I was in Atlanta trying to do it from over there. And uh, in hindsight, it's, it's made a lot more sense than mine did. And we're a lot more, uh, certainly better written than my, my piece was. Yeah, for sure. Paul Kimmage had spent the week building up a picture about Michelle. He talked to the swimming coaches to get their insight. It was more to the story than glory, glory, hallelujah. This is brilliant. And he tracked down Michelle's father, Brian, to get some background information on Michelle and to ask some awkward questions. Questions about drugs are being asked and, and the pain in, in, the, in Brian's face. You know, when I asked that, I could see that pain there. And I, You know, it was horrible, really. It was horrible. But I had to do it. The result was a searing piece of writing under the headline Shadow of a Scandal, where the questions were laid clear, as was the torment this issue was causing Paul Kimmage. And I'm in the... Main Press Centre on the Wednesday when she wins the third medal. And I'm going through all these notes and trying to get a shape in it and pull it together. And I hear, I hear in the background, you know, something's playing. And I think, fuck, I know what that is. That's the Irish anthem. And I look up and the flag is being raised and Michelle is on the podium being faded for her third gold medal. And I look up and I'm hearing her, her on the vein being played. And it just seems so absolutely obscene to me almost, listening to this. Because it's not, it doesn't bring me any joy. I'm tortured. 
I'm tortured by what I've got to write about this. I'm tortured by these questions. And it just, it just provokes an irrational kind of backlash, an irrational emotive, uh, foul backlash, but is certainly reflective of how I felt at the moment when Michelle won that third gold medal. So I quote Aaron V and Sheena Fina Fall, and I say, let me interpret that for you now. Gold, gold, gold. Three cheers for the Olympics. In five short days, the tally of 100 cheers. If I close my eyes, I can see the happy faces in Dublin and Cork and Mayo and Clare. A nation ignited by a brown-eyed girl. Here in Atlanta, the porter is flowing freely. If you're Irish, Fado Fado is definitely the place to be, but not for a twisted fucker like me. Paul Kimmage and his divided colleagues would return to Dublin with many questions left unanswered. Michelle, meanwhile, was welcomed back as a hero, despite her Dublin homecoming being washed out by torrential rain. The cloud of Atlanta would hang over Michelle and everyone involved in her story. Coming up on episode two of Tainted Gold, the Michelle Smith story. When the man who's in charge of the, the training regime, you know, the man she called the wind beneath my wings in her book, has this doping infraction against him, it's just very, very difficult to bury that. And I noticed that her physical appearance had changed significantly since the last time that I'd seen her. The dirty war. The dirty war, I called it. The dirty war, yeah, yeah. You've been listening to Tainted Gold, brought to you by Independent.ie's In Focus podcast series. This was produced by Kieran Lennon and Shane Brennan, with sound design from John Smith. Thanks to RTE for the use of archive audio. Listen and follow on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts.